Jim, meet Chris. Chris, meet Jim. Yeah, let's get right into it. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks for having me. So you and I know each other from Jamstack Denver. <laughs> this is this is a funny story because I had been staying in Denver with my sister and for no real reason contacted the Denver meetup because like I was there but at the same time it wasn't it wasn't an in-person meetup and I did my very first Redwood talk for Jamstack Denver and this was the beginning of September. I then went to the meetup after and I went like I watched and you gave a talk about Plenty, which is a Svelte static site generator. So why don't you give the explanation of kind of what Plenty is, and then also a little bit of your background and who you are. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and Anthony, I feel like we run in the same circles. I, I feel like we met maybe in Denver, but we I've seen you in all sorts of uh, Jamstack and Svelte-related meetups. After, like I think, like three or four interactions, we're like, okay, I think we have the same interests here, and uh, it's been fun connecting with you on that stuff. Plenty is a Svelte static site generator, and I started dabbling with Svelte a little while back, and at the time, there wasn't a lot of options for static site generation in Svelte. There was a project called Sapper, which is like a full stack Svelte type framework that can do static site generation, but there wasn't anything really focused on the jam stack, so I thought that Svelte and building something myself might be a good way to go. So to take a step back, I come from the agency life, so I worked in an agency for a while, I focused mainly on CMS technology, so Drupal and WordPress. I started my own agency back in 2015 and continued on that paradigm. I know I've worked with some pretty big brands doing that stuff, so like you know, City of Boston, Big Brothers Big Sisters, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research and stuff like that. And at that scale, CMSs can work really well because there's lots of resources that you can throw at caching, like setting up a reverse proxy with Varnish and making things really fast and secure. But I also have a lot of clients in the smaller realm of things, small nonprofits that CMS technology kind of falls flat a little bit for those types of sites. I often inherit sites from folks who haven't maintained their site in a long time and things like security updates and slow sites and all those problems kind of rear their ugly head if you're not careful with CMS technology. So I think my first introduction to Jamstack technology was back in... I want to say like early 2016, I started playing with Jekyll, the static site generator, which I believe was created by uh, Thomas uh, Preston Werner, which you guys had on the podcast, right? I was just listening to that last night. That was an awesome talk. Yeah, we talked about the whole the whole kind of history of that and his his blog post of blogging like a hacker and how he just wanted to be able to like, you know, get push and have his blog be, you know, deployed to the world. So it's funny, my friend who lived down in Austin, he, he did like a bunch of Rails work. He turned me on to Jekyll and I at first I thought it was just like a prototyping tool because I couldn't wrap my head around how it could be used in any sort of real way. I was like, well, this is really cool. I wish I could build sites this fast. Too bad it's not practical to do anything besides prototyping. That quickly changed. You know, I, I played around with a little bit more. I think I was really, when I really saw the light uh, of the possibilities was I was listening to a talk. I can't remember if it was at a, probably Jamstack Conf didn't exist at the time. It must've been like early 2017. Matt Billman from Netlify was talking about the Netlify CMS and like building a get back CMS with React and, and things like that. And I was like, this could be super powerful. So I was, I was totally bought in at that point. And I actually, I built a, a big production Jekyll site somewhere around that same time for the city of Boston. It was the budget.boston.gov site. And we were basically pulling from a JSON API to build a couple thousand pages. So I think it was something like 1600 pages we were pulling in. We were actually, it was like a hybrid build. We were, we were using a lot of gulp to pre-process things and pull down like a wrapper from, from the city of Boston uh, website to, to build out some of the pages and templates and things. But it was pretty cool because it was the first time that I, I pulled everything out into like a component-based architecture in the Jamstack. And we basically built our own little API so you could create markdown on the fly and it actually pull in structure in a, a dynamic way. So I was starting to, to see the possibilities for a more dynamic build process with a Jamstack. And I was really thinking that maybe this could be the solution I was looking for for some of my clients that were falling behind in their security updates and really couldn't pay for the hosting and all the expenses that go along with maintaining a CMS. So I was bought into the vision and basically I, I sat around for a couple of years waiting for someone to invent exactly what I was looking for. There's a lot of projects that were getting close, but maybe I'm just uh, too controlling, but I basically decided to, to step in and try to make something that was that was exactly what I was looking for because I've been playing around with Hugo and Gatsby and some other things, which are great projects, but uh, I wanted something very specific, I guess, for my needs. 
Yeah, this is really interesting because you are, as you're saying, coming from the the Jamstack world, which is awesome because this is the Full Stack Jamstack podcast. And so we've had lots of people on to talk about their their history with the Jamstack and it seems to be a common thread of people getting really into it and really loving it and seeing the potential of it and then stretching beyond it to fit their own kind of use case or needs in in whatever way that requires. And so I found the direction you've gone really interesting because it is in a sense full stack because you still are worried about where the data is actually being saved and how it's being accessed and how it's being rendered on the page and how that whole data flow is working. But you're not thinking about databases, you're thinking about CMSs. And a CMS and a database is like, what is the difference, what is not, you know, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a strange kind of nuanced thing. And I remember this actually confused me when I first saw your talk because I was, couldn't quite wrap my mind around the fact that the database was like you say, just JSON. And it's like just a bunch of JSON that is being turned into what you what you want it to be. And you also said at the very beginning about Sapper and Sapper being full stack. And I find that so interesting because Sapper is not full stack. Sapper is like next, which is also not full stack. And everyone says these things are full stack. And I get what you, what you say because people do say Sapper is full stack. But this is like, it's about the SSR. It's It adds the server rendering part, but it doesn't give you a database. So that's why I don't consider it full stack, right? Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I guess I never really thought about that way. I always thought just like if you're running, if you have to worry about running a programming language on your server, then you're, you're full stack in, my, in the way that I was defining it, right? So if you have to worry about running a server with Node.js or Go or something on it, then you're thinking full stack versus just deploying something to a CDN where you're not worrying about that, that back end. But no, that's a good point. Like if you're not really setting up the database and you're, I guess you're not fully going into the stack, right? You're, you're like three quarters of a stack. How did you kind of decide what type of CMS you you want? Because you're also kind of building a CMS for plenty at the same time. So this is like a huge world that I have like just barely kind of scratched the surface of. But like when you start building a CMS, like what do you even think about? How do you approach that? That's a great question. So this is kind of where I have to distinguish between vision and reality. So I, I think that I tend to get ahead of myself with like, where I want to go with some of the stuff. And Plenty is just, is a part-time project for me and some other folks who are working on it. So we're, we're trying our our hardest to to get things done, but it's a constant work in progress that we're changing a a fair amount because we're not in a stable 1.0 release yet. So we still do break things, but we try to be pretty conscious of making it easy for, for folks to upgrade. And we actually even release like a a dedicated Docker image for every release. So if you want to continue using like an older version of Plenty that we've changed the API, you could continue using that for a very long time. But in terms of like building a CMS, I basically fell in love with the model of the get back CMS. So people like Tina CMS and Netlify CMS, they're doing this thing. And it's not for everybody. I've definitely, um, I used to at the Jamstack Boston meetup that I started, I used to do some sessions way back in the day when it was in-person meetings uh, where we, we looked at like the Netlify CMS and setting it up. And some people really hate the idea of writing back to the repository and sto- storing all their content in the same repository. You could do some things to separate those two things, but the basic way that I envision things is to have a really simple workflow where everything's stored in the same spot, it's all flat files, and there's not a lot of thinking outside of that. And it, I think it works really well for small sites, but of course, if you have a site with thousands of pages and nodes, like that could become a difficult thing because your build process gets slow and there's all sorts of challenges with that. But I really like that model of a get back CMS. We've recently been discussing that it might be better for us to build some better API capabilities into the project early on because there's so many great headless CMSs out there. And if we focus too much on our get back CMS and we don't allow you to plug into the other ecosystem, I think we're really shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit because it's going to take us longer to build what we want in the get back version versus just allowing you to pull from some kind of rest endpoint to pull from like Strapi or Ghost or something like that. So We're stepping back to the drawing board a little bit. We're thinking about building that capability a little bit better. I think our project has some advantages because we don't define any custom keys in our data source. So the data source is completely up to you. And that's one of the goals of Plenty. We wanted a really transparent model from where you're storing your content and where you're writing your content structure to your layouts in your layout structure. So I think this is really hard in the CMS world. So if you come from Drupal or WordPress, like you know when you, you can create structured data through an interface, which is really 
nice, but when you come to pull it out in like your templates, if you're using Twig or something like that, it's really difficult to get raw data values. Like you have to really start going into nested field structures and a lot of complexity. Even I think some of the static site generators out there aren't doing a great job of this because they have all these defined keys and things like that, where you actually have to do a little digging to, to find out where your data is coming from. So you, you can like pull from certain fields, but you have to name them just the right way. And I think that plenty is, is great because it's really transparent in the way you can just define whatever mark, uh, whatever JSON key structure you want, and then you can just pull into your template and you don't have to really think about it. And I think that makes the API capabilities easier too, because we can basically just copy JSON down to the local storage and then just pull it into your template. You can basically, whatever the structure is you're getting from your API, you can accommodate in your template, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. And so it doesn't really matter kind of what type of API you're you're pulling f from because you're you're making plenty kind of like the normalization layer. Is that, what, is that what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, not to the level that something like Gatsby is, right? So Gatsby is great because it will pull everything into a common language, right? So it's like gra everything's going to be GraphQL by the time you get it, even if your plugin's pulling from a REST endpoint. So I think that idea is really cool. The whole like content mesh idea is powerful. I don't know if Plenty is going to be that powerful, at least in the beginning. I think our concept is just making things simple. So like we're going to try to get in your way as little as possible between where you're fetching your data from and then how you're using it in your template. So I would think that somebody could read an API from like if you go to like a public endpoint and you could look at the structure there and you could basically build your site off just looking at that if, if you wanted to because you're going to get the, the same content down to your local. It's just going to be happening at the build process, right? So like every time you build, it's going to look to the endpoint. It's going to copy that down and then you, and rebuild those pages based on that. Yeah, I'm just asking and, and thinking about this because this is something that I'm like doing right now with, with my coworkers with, with StepZen is we're taking things like WordPress and, and Dev.2 and turn them all into, into GraphQL schemas so you have one, you know, it's, it's very similar to the, to the Gatsby content mesh thing, but um, it brings in a larger range of like API types. So it's, we have like rest connectors, like all sorts of, all sorts of stuff. And I remember I actually made, made a joke about <laughs> uh, GraphQL and, and plenty at one of our meetups. So I was like, hey, you just like add GraphQL to it. It'll, it'll only take you a weekend, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I would love to do all that. It's, it really comes down to, I, I'm finding that now it's like, I have to be really conscious about like what we're focusing on and what we're doing. So just because there, we have so little like, effort hours that we can put into this. So I think for now, we're gonna do as little transforming as possible. Really, it's just gonna be like grab from a data source, point to whatever key ha holds the array of information and split it. So like, say you're trying to get events and you're looking at an endpoint with a bunch of events, like make sure you know where you're splitting it and then copy those down to individual content files. But yeah, as little transformation as possible for the beginning, I think. I think that's the, that's the way to go with, with any of these open source projects because they, they, they build over time. And if you can think long-term, then that's where you can scale yourself because you have a small amount of people, but if you like put in the consistent work, then you know it can it can build over time. So yeah, no, I think that's I think that's great. Let's get into the the Svelte kind of stuff. So we haven't had anyone on the show to really talk about Svelte. I have talked about Svelte a lot because I've been messing around with it on the side for about as pretty much as long as I've been doing any sort of like web stuff because I started learning React and made a very conscious decision to learn React because I wanted to get a job, you know, and I knew that was gonna be a smarter bet than than Svelte. But I found Svelte to be more interesting just because, you know, it's it's newer, it's different, it's in a lot of ways it's made as a reaction to to React because it's consciously not using the virtual DOM. But um we're probably getting ahead of ourselves. So let's give like the, the high level like elevator pitch. Like how do you explain Svelte to someone who is a web developer but doesn't know Svelte? Yeah, that's a great point. So Chris, we were talking about this real briefly before the, the call. So I think, so Chris, you have a background in, in React, right? So I did not have that. So I, I came into React, I did some React projects and uh, you know, some Gatsby projects here and there. For me, React is, is kind of difficult. I know a lot of people say it's like so easy and it should be easy to hop into, but for me, there, there's a lot of challenges to React. Like JSX to me is kind of confusing. I, I Basically, my princ my guiding principle for a lot of things is uh, less abstraction, even though you could argue that Svelte is, <laughs> is more abstraction. But like the idea of JSX, like you have to do some interesting things in there to make it be HTML, right? There's like a little bit of abstraction versus when I'm using Svelte, I feel like even though it's HTML X and it's not real HTML, it's like all going to be compiled, right? It feels like I'm writing regular HTML in a, in like a 
one file component. And then I'm sprinkling in JavaScript where I need to, so I can basically add a script tag and that you know goes to that component. And then I can add a style tag as well and that's scoped to that component. So everything's kind of component level scoped, which is nice. And I just feel like if I was someone coming from a HTML and CSS background and I didn't have a lot of higher web development experience, like I think so felt would for me might be easier to to get on board with than something like React, just because it's a syntactically simpler. That's subjective, I guess, but it seems sy syntactically simpler from my perspective, I guess. For me, it was just like a lower barrier for yeah. Yeah, what you're saying is that it's a great, it's a it's a really really great point, and it's what I try and hone in on on with Svelte. But I think we need to really dig into to what you're saying there is that React is a superset of JavaScript because it's using JSX, which is a JavaScript extension, whereas Svelte is a superset of HTML. It's building on top of that, and that is the, the way you should really think about these two things and how they're different from each other, is that one is trying to basically give you all the powers of JavaScript and like throwing functions all around and just let you stick HTML inside those functions, whereas the other one, Svelte, is saying, we're just going to take an HTML page and then insert JavaScript where we need it. That's kind of like the mental model of how you can think about these two things. Yeah. I always hear like the argument that pe people love React, and I think people sometimes people prefer React because they're saying, "Well, I'm writing real JavaScript, and I like I can understand it better." But I feel like when you start putting kind of like a template into JavaScript, you're still, I mean, you're writing. Yes, it's all like a, a JavaScript-based environment, but you still have to deal with like a template at some level. So it's like, do you want your template embedded in your JavaScript, or do you want your JavaScript kind of embedded in your template? And, and maybe it comes down to personal preference. To me, I only really know React, but. I do understand the fundamentals of JavaScript well. So to understand where React is doing things and JavaScript is, I think it's a lot like a car. Straight after you've learned to drive, you normally get a car. And then when you sell that car and you think about the brands, you go, oh, I had a Ford. Fords are pretty good cars to me. You know, I'd buy a Ford again. It's the same thing as like, I learned React first. But is it necessarily the best way of doing everything? Is it a very heavy-handed way of doing a lot of things? Yes, but it tends to be like the most popular option right now. This is where things like Spell and Vue really interest me. But then the hardest question is, why should I? Like, why should I learn it? Why should I reap the benefits? Because it's a two-pronged question really, is what's the benefits I learn? And then also what benefits would my team learn from swapping to it? And I think that's actually a really hard one because you could say with React, oh, the benefits of, you know, single development is there's a lot of components out there that are already built and you could just hook into. And when you're on a team level, you're normally the ones building them component libraries and a lot more in depth. It's not necessarily a better or worse way in my mind. It's just like, I need a car to get to A and B. When this one breaks down, you know, you look at the horizon and think of what's next. Those are great points. I And like, I can only give my perspective. And I guess if... If you're driving now, I'm now I'm extending your uh, analogy probably to places where you didn't intend. But okay, if if you have some basic, you know, mechanical skills and you can f change your oil and you can do certain things and you're comfortable with your car, then honestly, for me, it would be a hard sell to to tell you to stop using Ford or React or whatever it is, right? Like it's it, it if you're not if you're very comfortable and your team's efficient, then. I feel like, you know, everyone's going to pitch you to change something all the time. Like today it's felt and tomorrow it's something else, right? So um, I think, I don't know, for someone like you, it might be hard to sell. Now, for if you're worried about React being difficult for your team and taking on new members all the time and you're having a lot of spin up time to get people to a proficient level, then a long term goal might be something that has a lower barrier. Now, I feel like Svelte has a lower barrier, but that might not necessarily be true for everybody. Svelte potentially could have a higher barrier for someone else who has a different technology perspective than I do. So it, it's a hard sell, but I, for me, it was just, it was simpler, right? So I, basically with my project, I'm trying to onboard people who are coming from, you know, 
HTML websites or like they're they're tired of the CMS world and they just want something that's as simple as possible. So I actually had started Plenty way back on React for a very short period of time. But uh, as I dug more into Svelte, I, I switched it just because for my mental model, it just seemed a little simpler. And I wanted to, to capture that low-end um, new, newcomer environment. Um, and I thought that Svelte would get me there easier than React might. So that, that's just how I look at it, I guess. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't necessarily think like React is the best thing in the world. There's a lot of people that think like, why do we write JSX, you know? And there's been quite a few projects that have tried to replace that. They've never really gained a massive attraction, but there is, there they are out there. I guess my ultimate question without talking about technology is what is a safer choice for somebody who is independent JavaScript developer who needs to achieve a goal? So if your goal is getting a job, then probably React, right? Like if your goal is to join some larger team, then that might be your choice. If you're in a position, so my position is I have this small agency that, that I direct and my clients don't necessarily know about the technology that's being used to achieve their goals. And I personally can achieve their goals faster with Svelte than I can re with React. But that might be my own limitation in React, right? So for someone who, who just wants to build something and wants to have not a lot of headaches maintaining it, then I think Svelte might be a good choice. Of course, it, like, like I said, it's subjective, right? So there's a couple of things I want to hone in on here. So we're talking about whether Svelte is like better or not for, for beginners and I agree that Svelte is simpler in the sense that you're just you're writing less code. And this is actually one of the things when when Rich Rich Harris first created it and was like putting it out into the world and talking about it, this is a thing he said a lot is that the more lines of code you have, the more potential there is for bugs just by by definition. Like every line of code is a liability because that line of code could be wrong, you know. So it gives you nice, clean, simple, concise abstractions, which is really, really nice. The problem is that when you have a smaller ecosystem, you have less resources, you have less docs, you have less extra libraries that can simplify weird specific edge cases. So that's where you're gonna run into, into issues there. The Svelte by itself is much simpler, I think, but there's so much more to build with these things than just beyond the actual thing itself. Now, in terms of like the benefit and how we should be trying to sell or not sell, you know, Chris on Svelte, the real benefit for, for experienced developers is that you have a much smaller bundle size. You have a much more lightweight tool set. You can, as you say, you can move a lot faster because your tools actually move a lot faster. Now, this could change with ES build, but as of now, like Svelte's been living this like super awesome build lifestyle for, for years. Like everyone's using ES build now and they're freaking out. And they're like, oh my God, this thing's so fast. That it's like a whole different kind of programming. And people have been doing Svelte having to say like, yes, we know this is what we've been saying for years. And this is why they were the first ones to hop on this with Snowpack, you know, months and months ago with, with Svelte Kit, which is interesting because now they have dropped Snowpack and have changed to, to V. I've got one more question before we move on. Why should I learn Svelte when I hear Vue is pretty good? That's a great question. Um, in my opinion, so I'm, I'm not, I feel like I'm not the best to talk about, you know, Vue and, and React because I'm not that experienced in them. I've, I've touched them a little bit, but I feel like if you like the Vue experience, Svelte is very similar in like the, the way that it feels when you're writing it except you're getting away from the virtual DOM completely and you're, you're building it with like a, like a different compiled environment, right? So it's like, if you're gonna start heading the view direction, like just go all the way to the dark side and, and join us over on Svelte. <laughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> so why is the virtual DOM such a big point? Because you can say to me, the virtual DOM, but why do I care? Like, so there's a theoretical limit where it's not gonna matter, right? But for, for small sites, um, you're just loading less to the browser because you need less to actually run your code because it's just compiling down to regular JavaScript that you can run in the browser. And so it doesn't need this other layer to actually run your code. And so if you have a re like a really small site, then the virtual DOM is just going to be extra overhead that's potentially going to make your, your bundle size bigger and slow everything down a little bit. Um, but at some point, I guess there, there is like a, a crossover where your virtual DOM sites will probably be faster than your compiled Svelte sites. So 
if you're really worried about that performance, then you might want to know where that, that crossover happens. And so just so we know, the virtual DOM is technically the thing that decides to inject HTML into the browser, into the wrapper, basically. Say you using React. This is all theory that I built, I guess. Someone can tell me if it's true. Is basically you have an element that is on a Boolean. The Boolean's now true. So then React tells the virtual DOM, now add a div tag here into the virtual DOM. And then the virtual DOM will add that div tag into the actual HTML. Is that right? I think it is. I believe so. Anthony's nodding. So yeah, yeah, that's so that's that's the point of the virtual DOM is it, it does the diffing for you. So it looks at the DOM, it looks at the change you want to make, and it applies that change. Whereas with Svelte, there is no virtual DOM. With Svelte, you write all your Svelte and then you run it through a compiler, much like you would do with say TypeScript. Like you run TypeScript, you run it through a compiler and it spits out JavaScript, and then JavaScript is supposed to get sent to the browser, or even some kind of crazy mashed up version of JavaScript that gets further minified. So Svelte is just another step in the chain of letting you write something that is nice and makes sense to your brain and does all the things it needs to do, but then goes through steps of transformation to end up with something that the browser can understand. Now, it's also nice, though, is it does it in a way that doesn't require shipping a runtime, <laughs> so shipping or shipping just dependencies. So that's why you're able to just send regular JavaScript because if you think about it, like, how do we do this before React exists? I've had this conversation with people, but they're like, how does it work if there's no virtual DOM? I'm like, how did it work for like 15 years before React existed? You know, like that's how it works. <laughs> and I think a lot of it was, maybe it's because we've kind of like degraded CSS. Everything was just in the DOM, but just hidden with CSS. But now we're to the point where it's like, yeah, you can actually have loads of things in the DOM that are just hidden with CSS and it'd be fine. Because I guess that would be one my question was, well, you have, say, an accordion in React, it could actually remove the code from the DOM. But I guess with Svelte, it will just keep it there and hide it with some CSS. It'll actually remove the HTML from it if you need to. Like, it will manipulate the DOM. So it manipulates? Yeah, it does. Because JavaScript can manipulate the DOM. But then, why aren't there a virtual DOM? If it's manipulating the DOM, how does it know? It's a question for much smarter people than I am. Yeah, same here. Yeah, so I guess it, it is shipping some instructions, right? So it's like, maybe you could call it mini virtual DOM. I, I don't know, like... It's event listeners. It's just event listeners. That That's how JavaScript works. You have event listeners, which is what tells the JavaScript what manipulations to do like inner html or you know query selector like all these things that no one knows anymore no one learns because everyone uses these frameworks that are all dom frameworks yeah and is that thing when you talk about abstraction react is five out of five they've abstracted everything away where if you try to use window react cries but about would be about two out of five maybe lower maybe high it's hard to say. They they are like it, things are abstracted away. Like there's um so for instance like uh they made like a shorthand reactive syntax so you can use like a dollar sign which is supposedly uh, I can't remember what it is in regular JavaScript but it's a valid JavaScript syntax but that's not how it's used. So they they're basically hijacking that syntax to to make it like a shorthand reactive statement. So like it, there is abstraction like. It, the stuff that you're writing in your components, the JavaScript and the HTML and the CSS, it, it looks like regular JavaScript, HTML and CSS, but it's really not. It's it's HTML X because it's all getting compiled into something that's something else, right? So there is abstraction. It just, to me, it f doesn't feel like it. And so as long as it doesn't feel like it, I'm happy. It feels like it's just regular HTML. I guess my last question before we go deeper into some of the things is like, do you have things like styled components over there? Styled components? Like CSS and JS. Yeah, so this is this is an awesome question. This is the whole thing with single file components is that the point of Svelte is that you don't need a library like that because it's designed from the start to have your CSS scoped to your individual components. Everything is going to be three chunks. You're going to have your HTML, then you're going to have your styling, and then you're going to have your script. And every single page you have is a single file component. And this is similar to, to Vue. And this is one of the things that people really, really like about Vue and Svelte is the single file component. And this is why when Redwood came out, Swix wrote an article that said single file components 
have come to react <laughs> because of like you know how you could how you could do uh, like cells and stuff like that. So there is no need for for styled components because of how Svelte was designed from the ground up. Yeah, your your styles are automatically scoped to the HTML in that file. So like you really can write like a whole site without adding any class names whatsoever. You can basically just like if your components are reasonably scoped, then you can target those things specifically. And if you're adding styles that aren't targeting anything or the redundant, like it will automatically get shaken out of the, the thing. So it'll warn you about a lot of things. So it's really nice. It's a really nice experience. And like you don't even touch bubble or any of them kind of crazy things. Kind of. You have roll up. I thought roll up was dead. Well, not being maintained. Just sitting there. No, rollups actually just as active as, as Webpack because rollups being used by a lot of projects because it's been used by Svelte. But um, this is great. This is a perfect segue into this whole this whole question of the, the bundler and, and all this kind of stuff. So the, the important thing to separate first off is whether you're talking about bundling in development or bundling in production. So when you bundle in development, that's like having your Webpack server like running all the time and watching your project. And this is now changing to projects like Snowpack or Veet that are using ES build instead. And the question of using that in production is a whole separate question. So let's just talk about development now, first off. Let's just define some terms here. I've gotten pretty deep into, into all this stuff, so it's all fresh in, fresh in my brain. To start with the Webpack, we all know what Webpack is. That requires 20 different configs and tutorials on the internet just to get it working. How is Rollup different to Webpack? Because you can do it for React, as you can use Rollup instead of Webpack. I'm pretty sure Rollup and Webpack, they're very comparable in the sense that it was just kind of like a newer, slightly like a re-architected version of, of the similar thing. So it's still like it's still JavaScript and it's still just like a bundler and doing like minification and all that kind of stuff. Is, is, is that kind of right, Jim? Yeah, they're, you can use those two almost interchangeably. They have different plugins and different things that you can hook into them, but Rollup and Webpack are very similar. Even Webpack is not a React tool. React just uses Webpack. Yeah, exactly. I think you could technically use Webpack with Svelte. I think people just tend to use Rollup because... Did Rich create Rollup as well, Anthony? Yeah, yeah. So, so Rich Harris, the creator of Svelte, is also the creator of Rollup. So... All these tools he basically built together and they so they fit very well together. But people like Rollup just by itself. That's why they've used it for, for other projects also. And people, like you say, some people just really like Webpacks. They're familiar with it and they already know how to use it so they can bring that into, into Svelte as well. But with the newer kind of generation of build tools is where this starts getting interesting. So this is where ES build enters the picture because ES build, the thing that just makes it cool is that it's written in Go, which is funny because Plenty is, is written in Go. So there's actually some interesting kind of similarities here. And it just does the bundling really, really fast because <laughs> it's written in a different language. And it's also leveraging ES modules which is kind of a much larger rabbit hole that we don't need to need to go down. Oh, I think we should. Well, maybe we got, if we got time. So ES build is being used by Snowpack and Veet. And so these are kind of like higher level abstractions that are being built on top of ES build. And Svelte Kit, which is this new Svelte framework that's kind of like replacing Sapper, was originally using Snowpack, but is now changed to Veet. So I'd be curious to get your perspective on all of this, Jim, if you've used Vite, Snowpack, ES Build, any of these kind of things, kind of like where your, where your head's at with them. Yeah, I've used a few of them. I haven't used Vite, which I, I should use now because the, the whole um, spell kit inclusion. But uh, so when I was starting Plenty, I was using, the first thing I used was Rollup. And as most people know, when you use a bundler, it can slow down that whole process of being able to like get your site ready to be viewed, right? So. For people who aren't familiar with what bundles are doing, they can do a lot of things, but essentially your JavaScript files, when they're broken up to different files, like there's there used to be no way that you could read files across a project with many different files, right? So a bundle is basically putting everything into one spot. It's going through all your common JS like require statements and it's building everything in a way that a browser could could use it, right? So there's a new type of 
way to do this with, called ESM imports, which basically the browser now can read import statements to different files. And the challenge is it, it comes with a different syntax, right? So Node.js uses this syntax called require to actually pull in different JavaScript files. And there's this new syntax, the import syntax. So things like Dino are based on like the new browser based syntax, right? And that's why you're seeing these different versions of things. But there's also projects like Snowpack, which are, they're saying, hey, why don't we just use these imports so we don't have to bundle everything and pre-process everything every time. So it's kind of an interesting thing because when I was starting with Plenty, like I was using Rollup and that was, it was really slow. So then I moved to, well, slow is, I guess, relative, but it felt slow because I wanted that build to be really fast. And I, I think that like a lot of times projects, when they're talking about like build speeds, they only care about like the actual like compiling of components. And I, I for me, the build is the whole process from like, if you have to run a bundler, if you have to start up a web server, if you, that whole thing that it takes from when you click to when you see is the build, right? So for me, like I, I could get my compile step down pretty quick, but the bundler was still taking up a huge chunk of that time. So I moved over to Snowpack. Snowpack was significantly faster, but it was still slow. So Snowpack for me took about half a second to actually like get everything into the ESM import syntax and get it ready for the browser. And then the way that I'm using a, a Go-based project, right? So we had to use something called an exec command, which allows us to actually execute like the snowpack that's on your computer through NPM. And that was taking about another half second. So this whole thing was taking a second, which if you're used to bundlers, you're probably like, wow, a second, that's way fast. But for me, it was it was way slow. So I actually ended up building my own little tool called GoPack that basically is a less good version of snowpack. It, it doesn't do nearly as much, but it gets the base project working. So essentially what we're doing is we're going we're we're going through npm modules, we're finding your .mjs file. So that's a lot of npm packages will have a .mjs file which basically is an esm ready version of their package. So we try to find those and we we bring them over to your client side app and then we also go through all your svelte components and we convert all the paths. So like a lot of times people use relative paths or like shorthand paths and we convert those to like real paths that can be read by a browser and then we move everything over. So so basically cutting out the bundler can save a bunch of time if you're doing that. Now, if you want to get things production ready, you might want to still wrap things up and, and get things a little faster. So that's where something like ES build comes in. That's something we'll, we're definitely going to focus on down the road. It's not super urgent because even our non-optimized sites are like decently fast down the road. We want to make things better and more production ready. We'll probably pull an ES build. We had it in the project for a little while. ES build is super fast and it has an API so we can actually just run it from our command line tools so we don't have to like you know manage it outside of that which is pretty cool but yeah that's that's basically where our head is at there we, we wanted things to be as fast as possible so we figured cut out the bundler and do that process natively and go if we could okay so you said you were using es build or you still are using es build we had es build in the project for a little while to do some other things we'll probably pull it back into make better production builds and potentially allow for a larger ecosystem of projects that you can pull in. But right now we don't, we don't use anything besides our own homegrown like GoPack tool. Gotcha. Cool. It's, it's one of those things where I look at a, a thing like ES build and, and I get excited about tools that are like on the cusp of like being kind of pr production ready. And so it doesn't surprise me that you're, you've like experimented with it, but you still haven't like gone all in on. So uh, I always get excited about, about these things, but I always want to stress to listeners like, I want to be measured about these things also. <laughs> so you want to pay attention to the things that are going to like transform your, your workflow because I think it's going to be one of those things where people aren't really going to realize once the switch has happened, like people are going to start using frameworks that have ES build in it. And people who don't kind of ask a lot of questions about their, their tooling won't, won't know that something's different they'll just notice that it's gonna be way faster and it's way nicer and way more awesome and that's just gonna be you know just is slowly slowly but surely the direction this goes the excitement from me is that i instantly think like just buy a better computer and i have done that before as like javascript is getting too slow goddamn bundlers buy a computer with more ram more cpu but it just doesn't work like you think it's gonna work and that's where es build really does change the perception and it's so sad you're in a business you're like i'll buy myself a new computer you know i'll be faster because time is money and then you buy a new computer then two months later you're like why do i feel like i need to buy a new computer you know but it's because the tools we use as we start building m more complex projects really do slow down and things like 
ES build in things like Gatsby will completely change that framework because big websites, Gatsby can take like 10 to 15 minutes to like compile them. So it's this thing that the hidden complexities are very much hidden and that's where things like ES build can help not necessarily show them to you but just help as projects get bigger and bigger for sure i mean i'm definitely conscious of the speed of things like i i'm really so the idea going back and i know this is still just visionary at this point but like the whole get back cms like integration this whole integrated jamstack approach where it feels like you're using a traditional cms but but lighter and, and easier the cold startup time for building things is super important to me because everything's going to happen in CI and CI doesn't have contextual awareness of anything that's happened before, right? Like you have to spin up a container, you have to like rebundle, rebuild, do like NPM install if you're NPM installing, you have to do all that every time you do it. And so if you have those steps that slow down, that down every time, it's going to be a challenge to have a real time feedback loop. So basically the idea with, with Plenty was to cut all that stuff out, right? Like have a really minimal container with just the binary on it. So Plenty is kind of cool because you don't need any programming language, you don't have to have Node.js or Go or anything installed to use it. And it should just like have that end-to-end -end process should be a lot faster. So our, our compile step is probably faster than a lot of other projects compiling um, felt because we really dug into the, the API and like we're actually hitting the compiler directly and we're doing that in V8. And so that stuff is pretty fast in general, but we're really just cutting out like all those steps around it to make it faster. So I think that's where our biggest gains are, are being made at this point. Awesome. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time here, Jim. We covered a lot of ground here. We've had some listeners who really want the the very dense technical kind of episodes. So I hope this one this one satisfied them. We went very deep into a lot a lot of topics in this one, and I, I really really recommend people check out Plenty. I think it's I think it's a really cool project, and it's it's really different from I can't think of many other things that it's kind of like similar to so i always enjoy people who kind of like really stretch out to like what can a framework be what can you do with a framework and it sounds like you still have a lot of ideas of where it could go and how you could continue to grow it so definitely recommend people check it out uh, why don't you let people know kind of where they can find you where i think where they can contact you where your kind of hub is sure yeah uh so you can always reach out to me personally on twitter i'm at jim a fisk or you could reach out to the plant Plenty project. It's at Plentico. Plenty is spelled with an I, not a Y. It's just for some people who aren't familiar. If you want to check out our GitHub, it's just github.com forward slash Plentico as well. But yeah, we love to hear from, from folks. So uh, definitely give us feedback, positive or negative. It, it helps either way. And if you're interested in helping out, just, just contact me and I'd uh, be happy to, to onboard you in some way. Thank you for joining us. And maybe I'll give Svelte a go one day. Maybe. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you both for having me on. Have a good one.